Hello, my name is David Cahoon, and this is a, a talk which I gave at the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine in Oxford in 2018. It's about the misinterpretation of p-values and the contribution that that misinterpretation might make to the crisis in reproducibility. I already have a, a video on this topic on YouTube made in 2015 that was called False Discovery Rates, the movie. Perhaps the main difference here is that what I called in the earlier work the false discovery rate, I now call the false positive risk. I must apologize for that rather confusing change in notation, but the term false discovery rate had been used widely in the literature about multiple comparisons and that resulted potentially in confusion because I'm not talking about multiple comparisons. I'm talking about how you interpret the p-value from a single unbiased experiment. It's still very common for people to think that the p-value is the results, probability that your results occurred by chance and it is not the probability that your results occurred by chance are best defined as the probability that if you have observed a result which you declare to be significant, quote unquote, on the basis of the p-value and therefore you claim to have made a discovery, the false positive risk is the probability that you make a fool of yourself by declaring that you've made a discovery when you haven't and the results are simply due to chance. So, here goes. I usually start these talks with this slide of UCL's portico, partly because this beautiful cherry tree in the quad, now dead sadly, uh, it was, was in full bloom but mainly because the picture was taken on the 20th of March 2003 where UCL was the starting point for the second great anti-Iraq war march. So this, above anything, shows the folly of believing things that aren't true and that, in a sense, is the topic of this talk. The problems are the statisticians don't agree what to do about it and this was made very clear in the opening remarks of Kristin Lennox who is giving a talk on the problems at Lawrence Livermore Labs. That's in the next slide. Today I speak to you of war. A war that has pitted statistician against statistician for nearly 100 years. A mathematical conflict that has recently come to the attention of the normal people. And these normal people look on in fear, in horror, but mostly in confusion because they have no idea why we're fighting. What Kirsten Lennox was talking about, of course, was the war between Bayesians and frequentists. And it is the fact that statisticians quarrel among themselves so much about the proper way to decide whether an effect is real or not that is part of the reason that they've been talking about it for the best part of a century and still nothing as much has happened in the real world of medical research. It's my aim to build a bridge between Bayesian and frequentist approaches and although the and one, uh, one problem with that, of course, is that you get flack from both sides, but, but here goes anyway. What I want to know is the probability that I'll make a fool of myself by claiming that an effect is real when in fact it's nothing but chance. It's important to notice that I'm talking about how you interpret the result of a single perfectly performed experiment that's been randomized and all the assumptions that are made in the analysis of the experiment are exactly true. 
there are all sorts of other ways in which things can go wrong faults in randomization faults in blind blinding incorrect analysis multiple comparisons and p hacking for example i'm not talking about any of those i'm talking about a single perfectly conducted experiment it turns out that the risk of false positives is bigger than most people realize and all these other problems can only make matters even worse than I say. So the conclusion of this talk will be, among other things, <coughs> that if you observe a peak value close to 0.05 and conclude that you have discovered something, there's at least a 27% chance of making a fool of yourself, not a 5% chance. And if the hypothesis was an implausible one in the first place, then the probability of making a fool of yourself is a great deal higher than that. I don't think that many people will now require evidence that there is a crisis in reproducibility, at least in some areas of science. The one that has been perhaps best investigated is in experimental psychology. The great collaborative effort to reproduce experiments was done by Brian Nosek and published in 2015, ten years after John Ioannidis's famous paper in which he said most experiments are wrong, most published medical research is wrong. In, and the result of this collaboration what did appear to justify Ionidis's gloomy uh, proposal. They replicated a hundred experiments, a hundred uh, famous experiments in psychology, and the upshot was that only 37% of them were rated to have been replicated. That is pretty disastrous. It means that almost two-thirds of the published literature was wrong. There are other attempts, one by the amazing John Ioannidis says that the false positive probability, that's what I call false positive risk, is likely to be more than half of the entire literature in cognitive neuroscience and psychology. Uh, this, of course, psychology is not the only area where there are problems. There are big problems in cancer research, in genetic screening, GWAS apparently, uh, particularly, and also in fMRI, which comes under the heading of cognitive neuroscience, I guess. They looked at healthy controls and using the most common software packages for fMRI analysis, they found false positive rates of up to 70%. And since most people rely on packages and don't do any calculations themselves, that is uh, very serious indeed. Now, what I'm going to say is not in the least new. It, this is a wonderful quotation I discovered from 1966. The major point of this paper is that the test of significance does not provide the information concerning phenomena that are characteristically <laughs> attributed to it, <coughs> and that, furthermore, a great deal of mischief has been associated with its use. What will be said in this paper is hardly original. It is, in a certain sense, what everybody knows. To say it out loud is, as it were, to assume the role of the child who pointed out that the emperor was a actually only outfitted in his underwear. This was known in 1966 and it was referred to as being old knowledge. It, it 
dates at least from the 1930s that Harold Jeffers and uh, arguably for, uh, since the 18th century Thomas Spays but it is still to this day largely ignored by journals and by authors. Twenty years ago Doug Altman who of course has very recently died sadly published an editorial in the BMJ arguing that much research was of poor quality and misleading. Twenty years ago, twenty years later, I fear that things are not better but worse, says Richard Smith in 2014. Altman's conclusion was, we need less research, better research, and research done for the right reasons abandoning using the number of publications as a measure of ability would be a start. That is very true, I think. John Ioannid has put it even more strongly. Most scientific studies are wrong, and they are wrong because scientists are interested in funding and careers rather than truth. I mean, that, that is uh, uh, pretty vicious. For a start, he's not talking about all of science, not physics, not hardcore biophysics even, I think. Uh, but in some areas, it, it is at least true. And it's also right to say that no amount of statistical uh, jiggery-pokery will combat the basic cause, which is the pressure to publish. That is simply disastrous and that culture has to change if science is to retain any sort of reputation. Now, at the heart of the problem of making a distinction between p-values and the false positive risk lies a problem known as the error of the transposed conditional. That sounds really rather technical and a bit daunting, but a few examples should make it quite clear. I've written a piece about the sort of logical principles in Eon magazine, which you might find a bit helpful. Consider these examples. The probability that it's cloudy, given that it's raining, is high. The probability that, it is, probability that it's raining given that it's cloudy, is much lower. In these expressions, that vertical bar there is read as given. The reason, of course, for that is that it's, when it's raining, it's almost always cloudy. But when it's cloudy, it's often not raining. The condition, the thing after the bar, represents the denominator of the probability. And because it's often cloudy but not raining, the denominator is large and the probability is correspondingly small. Take a more stark example. The probability that you have four legs, given that you're a cow, is high. There aren't many three-legged cows around. In contrast, the probability, the probability that you're a cow, given that you've got four legs, is much lower because many animals have four legs but are not cows. Ask any dog. And the denominator is correspondingly high and the probability is low. Now, Here's something, an example which is more closely related to real life, a legal example. If you're lucky in a criminal case, you might be able to work out the probability of getting the evidence if the suspect is guilty. The trouble is, that's not what we want. What we need is the probability that the suspect is guilty given the evidence. And in some circumstances, that latter one is much lower. There's an example on my blog 
of a particular example where that's the case. Okay, so now we come to the nub of the problem, p-values. What a p-value is, the probability that, given the null hypothesis is true, that we make the observations that we have made, or more extreme ones. This probability is the p-value. The trouble is, it's not what we want. What we want is the probability that the null hypothesis is true, given the observations that we've made. That's clearly what we want, and that, in fact, is the false positive risk. So you can see these two probabilities are quite different. You can also see that the p-value can't possibly tell you what the probability of the null hypothesis probability of the null hypothesis being true or false because it assumes it's calculated for the case where the null hypothesis is true that's the condition for calculating it so it can't tell you uh, possibly anything about the truth of, of that uh, condition In order to make more clear the arguments concerning tests of significance, it will be helpful to start with a case which is much simpler to understand and which provides an analogy, though an imperfect analogy, as I'll discuss later, and that is the case of screening tests. This will be familiar to most people in the audience, I think, but I'll go through it anyway simply because it provides uh, the right sort of background. Suppose that we are testing a population for uh, the presence of a particular condition in a diagnostic screening. Suppose, for example, that we test 10,000 people. Now, what we would want to know and may know is the prevalence of that condition in the population. So let's go for the case where that prevalence is quite low, say one, only 1% 1 of the population suffer uh, uh, from the condition for which we're testing. 99% do not have the condition, 1% do have the condition. 1% is very roughly the prevalence of mild cognitive impairment in the whole population. It's a bit older in the aged. So, when we test them, first consider the test on the 9,900 people who don't have the condition. Well, if the specificity of the test is 95%, what that means is that 95% test negative, which is what they should test because these people don't have the condition, and 5% test positive. So there are 5% of 9,900, which is 495 false positives. The trouble is that this, this is directly analogous, of course, to an ordinary null hypothesis test of significance. 5% false positives. It doesn't tell us, however, what we want to know, which is the risk of being a false positive. And in all this, this, arg this uh, argument, which is like a null hypothesis significance test, can't tell us that because we must also know how many, the total number of positives, including the, f the true positives. So we need this upper arm, if 1%, that's 100 people, ha have the condition, in fact, then suppose the sensitivity of the test is 80%. That means 80% give a positive result. And they're, of course, true positives, because these people do actually have the condition. But 20% don't have the condition. Sorry, 
in 20% the condition is not detected, so there's 20 false negative tests. Now we can work out the false positive risk. The total number of positive tests is 80 true positives and 495 false positives. So the proportion of positive tests that are false is 495 on 495 plus 80, and that's 86%. It is not 5%. This, uh, as caused, is why it's barely possible to screen a population for a rare condition. You have to have enormously high specificity and sensitivity to get the right answer without a vast proportion of false positives. And of course, diagnosing somebody uh, incorrectly as being a positive or suffering from the condition can be disastrous. People can lose a breast quite unnecessarily, for example. Now, as I said, this is uh, a rough analogy to the significance test problem, which we'll deal with in the next slide. It's why when you see someone plugging their latest biomarker in the newspapers, you should always ask for what the sensitivity of the test is, the specificity, and what the prevalence of the condition in the population is, and do a calculation like this, because nine times out of ten you find that the test is pretty useless, and the, can, the calculation should, of course, have been done by the authors, but frequently isn't because it's not good for their career to do it. Right, now to the case of tests of significance, which is the point of that previous uh, slide. As I said, the analogy with screening tests is not perfect, but it's good enough that it will give you the idea, I hope. Suppose we do a thousand tests of significance. We need an analogue of the prevalence of, eff of effects in the screening example, and this prevalence is a much more slippery concept in this case. I think one can think of particular examples where the prevalence can be given an ordinary frequentist interpretation, uh, but by no means always. But let's plough on anyway. Let's suppose, for the sake of example, that in a thousand tests, only 10% of them have a real effect and that there's no effect in 90% of them. You could, for example, imagine that you do the same test on a thousand different analogues of the same drug molecule and test it on the same receptor. In that, a case like that, you would be lucky if 10% of them were active so it would be a reasonable numbers to take in that case. Now, if we test these at a significance level of 0.05, this is a terrible expression, but it's a common one, then of course we get 5% of false positive tests. Five percent of nine hundred is forty five false positives. You also get eight fifty five true negatives. This is the classical null hypothesis testing scenario, but it won't tell us what we want. No, no, to tell us what we want, we need also the upper branch of this tree diagram. We need to consider we need to know how many positive tests there are altogether. There are 100 tests in which there, there's a real effect, 
And if the power of the test, that means that we detect that real effect in 80% of cases, so we get 80 positive tests, which are all true positives. We also get 20 false negative tests. So now we can work out the false positive risk. The total number of positive tests is 80 plus 45. The proportion of those that are false positives, that's the false positive risk, is 45 over 45 plus 80. It is 36%, not 5%. This is the problem with p-values. The p-value says it's 5%, it's actually 36%. Well, as I'll come to very shortly, the analogy with uh, significance tests is a, a bit flaky, and I think the true answer here is not 36%, but 76% false positive risks. It's worse than this example suggests. That's something I'll come to in a few slides' time. Now, on the basis of the last slide, we can make it very clear what the difference is between the p-value and the false positive risk, and it lies in the denominator that you use to calculate the probability not the numerator, so it depends on the conditioning of the probability. In the last slide out of 900 tests in which the null hypothesis was true, there were 45 positive tests, and they were all, of course, false positives. So the p-value is 45 over 900, which is 0 0.05. But that is not what we want. What we want is the total number of positive tests, which is 45 false plus 80 true positives. So there are 125 positive tests, of which 45 are false positives. So the false positive risks risk is 45 over 125, which is 36%, which is what we got from the tree diagram. The numerator is the same in both cases, 45 false positives, but the denominator is different, and that 36% is what we got by the tree diagram approach. As I have already said, the tree diagram approach is, is somewhat misleading, and that number should actually be 76%, as I'll show uh, shortly, but this illustrates the principle. So the p-value is not the probability that your results occurred by chance. That is the false positive risk. One suggestion that a number of people have made to help with clearing up the confusion over p-values is to say that the solution is simply to know what p-values tell you. It is true that most people don't, and even if they can narrate the definition correctly, which is by no means universal, it still is not that helpful in understanding what it can tell you. I think this prescription won't work simply for the reason that when you do understand what the p-value tells you, you realise that it doesn't tell you what you need to know. That, I think, has been made obvious by the fact that the in the tree diagrams that I showed earlier, for screening diagnosis and for the tests of significance, showed the you need, showed that you need to know not only what happens when the null hypothesis is true, that's the p-value, but you also need to know what happens when the null hypothesis is not true, that's the upper limb of those tree diagrams. You need to know both in order to get the false positive risk. And that means that we must only have the we, we must uh, not only have the null hypothesis, which we can call H0, 
but we must also have an alternative hypothesis which says that there is a real effect which we can call H1. Uh, it's been put this way. Knowing that the data are rare when there is no true difference is of little use unless one determines whether or not they are also rare when there is a true difference. And this brings us to the only equation in this talk, and this is the famous Bayes' theorem. What it says is that the odds on there being a real effect after the experiment are equal to the likelihood ratio multiplied by the odds on there being a real effect before the experiment was done. This odds on the real effect before the experiment was done is known as the prior odds and the odds on there being a real effect after the experiment is known as the posterior odds and this term, the likelihood ratio, which converts one into the other, is what measures the strength of the evidence provided by the experiment. The likelihood ratio is defined as the probability of the observations if the null hypothesis is true on the denominator and in the numerator the probability of the observations if the null hypothesis is not true and there is a real effect. The evidence has to be relative. What matters is the ratio between these two probabilities. This definition brings up an interesting point. Suppose that we're willing to ex to, to suppose that the odds on the, there being a real effect before the experiment were one. In other words, there's a problem is a 50-50 probability as to whether there's a real effect or not. There are circumstances in which this might be optimistic, but if we are willing to make that assumption, then we see that the odds on there being a real effect after the experiment, which is what we want, is simply equal to the likelihood ratio. And that is why the likelihood ratio has been suggested by some people as an alternative to the p-value as a way of specifying the results of an experiment. And that's not a bad idea, but I don't think it's perfect, and we'll come to that in a little while. Now we come to the uh, subtle complication which I mentioned earlier. The, this is the reason why the tree diagram approach to tests of significance is, I think, inadequate. There are two different ways in which you can relate the observed p-value to the false positive risk. This has been known to statisticians for almost ever, but you barely ever see it mentioned in the biomedical literature, and even in mathematical papers, it's not always mentioned explicitly, it's buried in the mathematics, and therefore goes unnoticed. The most common method one sees of calculating false positive risks in the literature now is what I call the P less than approach and this is the approach the approach which is given by that tree diagram that I showed. John Ioannidis uses it, um, Wackholder used it when he coined the term false positive report probability, but I think it is inappropriate for the interpretation of a single experiment and I think that it underestimates the false positive risk. What we actually need is what I've called the P equals approach. I think the easiest way to make clear the difference between these two approaches is by simulation. 
uh, with tests rather than doing the mathematics. The mathematics aren't that difficult, but simulation is easier. This is what I did in the 2014 paper. Suppose that we have observed in our one real experiment that P equals 0 0.047. How do we interpret that? That's the question. Well, we can simulate 100,000 t-tests. That takes us about three minutes on a modern computer. And we can do it first with the null hypothesis not true, with the difference between means of some specified value, and then repeat it with the, in the case where the null hypothesis is true. And if we use equal numbers for the case where the hypothesis is not true and when it is true, that implies a prior probability of 0 0.5 for the null hypothesis being true, or uh, equally 0 0.5 for there being a real effect. Of course, we can combine these two in any numbers we want to get any other prior probability if we wish. So, for the P less than case, which is the most common in the literature, what do we expect to happen? Well, when the null hypothesis is true, we expect 5% of P values to be less than, equal to or less than 0 0.05. So we expect 5,000 false positives out of the 100,000 simulations. If the null hypothesis is not true, we expect 78% of p-values to be less than 0 0.05 if the power of the test is 78%. So we expect 78,000 true positives. And we then can calculate the false positive risk by this method as the number of false positives over the total number of positives and that comes out to be 0 0.06. So you may say, where's the problem? That's barely bigger than the 0 0.05 significance level. Well, the problem, I think, lies in the fact that this is not a sensible way to calculate the false positive risk. What we need is the P equals method. We have observed in our one real experiment P equals 0 0.047. That's the data. So we are interested only in experiments that come out with P equals 0 0.047. We are not interested in things that come out with P less than that. So we can do this by simulation too. Of course, it'll be very rare for a p-value to come out to be exactly 0 0.047. So if we're doing it by simulation, we just count the number of p-values in a short interval around 0 0.047, say between 0 0.045 and 0 0.05. And out of the 100,000 simulations, 511 came out with p-values in this range when the null hypothesis was true. But when the null hypothesis was, was not true, rather more, 1424, came out with p-values in that range. So the false positive risk is the number of False positives, 511, over the total number of positives. And that comes out to 26.3%. And that is the basis for the claim that I keep repeating, that if you have a p-value close to 0 0.05, then you can expect at least 26% of false positives. I repeat, the p-equals method looks only at the tests which come out the same as your experiment did. It doesn't look at lower p-values, which you haven't in fact observed and are therefore irrelevant. Of course, if the prior probability was less than 0.5, then uh, the false positive risk would come out a good deal bigger than 26%. Now, the problem with the arguments that I've been given is this slippery quantity, the prior probability of there being a real effect. The problem is that you virtually never know it. 
and i come to some ways of getting around that problem in a little while but meanwhile we can point out i think that it would be foolish to ignore it altogether and there are some here's some reasons why it's easy to devise an experiment in which there is a prior probability of zero of there being a real effect you simply give the same pill to both groups and since they're identical there's obviously a zero probability of finding any difference between them uh, equally you could give a, a dummy pill to one group and a homeopathic pill to the other group and since they're chemically identical there would be a zero probability of there being a real effect and this graph shows the prior probability that there's a real effect plotted against the false positive risk you can see that if there's a prior probability of 0.5 the false positive risk is 26 percent as i just said if the prior probability of a real effect is zero the false positive risk is a hundred percent so although there is no effect in this case and because there's no effect the null hypothesis is always true and because the null hypothesis is always true you get five percent of false positives but what matters is that a hundred percent of those positives are false positives that's the important bit at the other extreme if we knew in advance that all the hypotheses we tested were true and the prior probability of a real effect would be one and all positive tests would be correct because uh, th there would be no false positives so my conclusions are based on the premise that it's not legitimate unless you have some hard data to assume any prior probability greater than 0.5 that's why the bit of this graph above 0.5 is in red if you were to assume a greater prior probability than 0.5 you would have to go to an editor and say yes I have discovered this effect and my statistical argument is based on the fact that I was 85% uh, sure there was a real effect before I did the experiment for example that would reduce the false positive risk considerably but good luck with persuading anybody with an argument that has that basis it clearly is not good enough in the absence of strong hard data to assume that you're more likely than not to be right before you did the experiment so that is why I say for any prior of 0.5 or less the false positive risk is 26 percent for a prior of 0.5 but for a prior of 0.1 it comes out much higher to be 76 percent this is all calculated for a well-powered test by the p equals method Now these graphs from my 2017 paper are in to show the difference between the p equals method and the p less than method and also to show over a wide range the relationship between the p value and the false positive risk. The graphs on the right hand column are the same data as the graphs on the left hand column but on the right hand column they're plotted on a log log scale which shows up better the results for small p-values and this red dashed line is the line of equality this is where the data would lie if the false positive risk were equal to the p-value it's commonly assumed that it is but you can see that the actual lines are nowhere near this line of equality the false positive risk 
is always a great deal bigger than the p-value, in other words. So if we take our implausible hypothesis, that was a prior of point 0.1, we see that whether we use the p less than method, which is the dashed line, or the p equals method, the false positive risk is always enormously bigger than the p-value. If we look at a more plausible hypothesis with a prior probability of there being a real effect of 0.5, we see that using the p equals method, which is uh, the appropriate method, the false positive risk is still a good deal bigger than the p-value above the red dashed line. It's true that if we use the p less than method, then around 0.05 the false positive risk is almost the same it's six percent we just worked out um, than the p-value though even in that case when we go to smaller p-values the false positive risk is still considerably bigger than the p-value but in any case this dashed line the p less than method is not the appropriate thing to calculate in my view the p equals method is what we need So we have established, I think, that if we observe p equals 0.047, then we are interested only in experiments that come out with p equals 0.047. So we need the p equals approach to calculate the false positive risk. And that is what is used in these graphs, again from my 2017 paper. And these show the effect of varying the sample size. Again, the graphs in the right-hand column are just log-log plots of the same data as in the left-hand column. So we can concentrate on the log-log plots for simplicity. And these calculations are done for three different, four, three different sample sizes. The red lines show a low-power experiment with a sample size of only four. The green is an intermediate sample size, n equals eight, which corresponds to a power of 46%. And the blue is for n equals 16, which corresponds to a, a power of 0.78, a well-powered experiment. Now, you would expect intuitively that the well-powered experiment, the blue line, would give you a lower false positive risk than the weakly powered experiment, the red line, which is a, only a power of 0.22. That's a very low power, but it's one which is actually surprisingly common in the literature nonetheless. And if we look at low p-values, this shows the observed p-value and the false positive risk is up the, the ordinate, we see that that is indeed the case. The false positive risk with a well-powered experiment is lower than with the weakly powered experiment. What is less surprising is that for p-values close to 0.05, these lines actually crossed when calculated in this way. So one comes up with the conclusion that for p-values close to 0.05, the false positive risk is actually surprisingly independent of the power of the test. This is a well-known phenomenon. Uh, I, I found it in my first paper or by simulation methods but by the exact calculations one can get the graphs over a much wider range and it, it, it's a known phenomenon in the literature. The main point though is that whatever method you use and whatever sample size you use uh, 
the false positive risk is a great deal bigger than the p-value because if they were equal you get that dashed red line. So here's a few random examples that I've picked out of the literature of the sort of thing that is only too typical of the biomedical literature. Here we see two dose response curves and they're compared point by point. In fact, only one of the differences, the one at this highest concentration, was quote significant unquote and that has a single star and it, the all the paper says is p less than 0.05 so even apart from the multiple comparisons problem this even this single point is is very much in doubt here's another example bar charts. Bar charts of course always ought to have the original data points plotted on them not just a, a plain bar and standard error but again we see three of them have a single star and all it says is p is less than 0.05. That, apart from the fact that that corresponds to a large false discovery rate uh, it's not satisfactory of course to give only the p equal to or less than 0.05 the exact p value should be given this was a second paper i picked up out of a, a standard journal and it is very typical of the sort of things one sees desperately unconvincing okay now here's an actual example with which to illustrate the ideas i've just been talking about this was a study published in Science magazine and it, the paper concluded that transcran transcranial electromagnetic stimulation improved associative, associative memory P equals 0 0.043 This conclusion was tweeted and the altmetric score shot up because anything to do with memory gets attention. The tweet referred only to the memory aspect of it, though that turned out to be a very small part of the paper. Of course, most people would not have actually read the paper, which is behind a paywall. So what was the evidence? If you looked at the main body of the paper, you found that most of it was not about memory at all it was about fmri and memory in fact was only mentioned as one subsection of figure one figure one b here this rather unimpressive graph shows that the difference between sham and stimulation had a single star corresponding to and the actual p-value was 0.043 the effect size was not even mentioned in the main body of the paper. You had to get into the supplementary material to find that. So when you look into the supplementary material, you find that the sample size was only eight. But just to give them the benefit of the doubt, uh, I've done some calculations which correspond to a, a well-powered experiment. and. The result is that p equals 0.043 means there's at least a 23% chance that it's a false discovery. By at least, I mean that's what you get if you assume in advance that there was a 50-50 chance that this rather random zapping of the brain was going to improve associative memory. That's pretty debatable itself, of course. To add insult to injury, Science Magazine had recently boasted that with help from the American Statistical Association, Science had established a statistical 
board of reviewing editors to provide better oversight of the interpretation of data. It seems that the Statistical Reviewing Board hadn't paid much attention to this paper. This example of memory and transcranial magnetic stimulation is an interesting one because it may, enables me to give an example of the main aim of this paper, which is to provide better ways of expressing the evidence from an experiment. It's fairly easy to calculate these numbers if you delved into the material in the supplementary material, you've got enough to do the calculations and it's described step by step in my 2018 paper in archive, the way to do it. The simplest way to do it is with our web calculator, which has three choices and the three interpretations of that experiment I shall now give correspond to the third, first and second choices. The first thing to notice was that in the main body of the paper, they didn't even specify the effect size. It was actually 1.88 plus or minus a standard error of the mean of 0.85. And the confidence interval went from 0.055 to 3.7. These numbers represent the extra words recalled on a baseline of about 10 extra words recalled. So the improvement is from 10 to 11.88 roughly, so it's a, a rather small effect anyway. But it corresponded to p equals 0 0.043, and my contention is that that method, that this result would be much clearer if you accompanied the p value and the effect size and confidence limits with a statement that the false positive risk i.e. the probability that the results occurred by chance only is at least 18% and that means that the result is no more than suggestive. Another statement that you could make is to calculate the prior probability that you would need in order to reduce the false positive risk to some specified number, 0.05 is the obvious number. So you could say that this increase in performance gave p equals 0.043, which is what they did say, but add to that that the statement that in order to reduce the false positive risk to 0.05, it would be necessary to assume a prior probability of 18%, 81%, that there was a real effect before the experiment was done. So you'd have to be almost certain that there was a real effect before you did the experiment in order to be able to claim a false positive risk of 0.05. And since there was no evidence before the experiment that the result was anything like as likely as that, the result can be, again, considered no more than suggestive. A third option would be to notice that the increase in performance gave p equals 0.03, but that in order to reduce the false positive risk to 0.05, it would have been necessary to observe p equals 0.0043. Point oh four three is nothing like as low as that, it's tenfold higher. So again, we can say the result is no more than suggestive. I think of these three options, I prefer the first one. It's true that that's only a minimum false positive risk. It could be much higher than that, but it would be a great, it would be a great improvement on the present situation of a statement that, like that were added and the advantage of specifying a false positive risk or a minimum of false positive risk is that the false positive risk is easy to understand. It is, after all, what many people still think the p-value tells them, but doesn't. 
Personally, I like this reverse Bayes method where you calculate the prior, but prior probabilities are slippery and they're unfamiliar to people, so perhaps that's not the best option. This slide shows the interface on our web calculator. All, all, of our pro, all of our papers come with R scripts, but not everybody is into using R, should be, but it, they're not. And this makes the calculations very easy. The calculator can be found at fpr-calc.ucl.ac.uk. If you Google false positive risk calculator, UCL, it comes up uh, near the top. The calculator has three options controlled by these three radio buttons. There are actually, apart from the observed p-value, there are two other variables that matter. One is the false positive risk and one is the prior probability of there being a real effect. The first option calculates the prior value for a given false positive risk and p-value. The second option calculates the p-value for a given false positive risk and prior. And the third option calculates the false positive risk for a given p-value and prior. This shows uh, the result of the calculations for the first option, calculating the prior. The inputs you need are the observed p-value and the false positive risk which you want to attain, 0.05 and observed p-value is 0.043. The other things which you have to specify are the number in each sample and the observed effect size, the normalized effect size, expressed as a multiple of the standard deviation. So this left-hand panel of the input, the right-hand panel is the output, and that adjusts itself whenever you change a number in the input. If you do it on a mobile phone, the right panel comes below the left panel. But it is one of the delightful things about web applications is that they will work on any system that will has a browser, so they'll work on a mobile phone. So the output is, if you use the P equals calculation, that you would need an 85% prior probability that there was a real effect in order to achieve a false positive risk of 0.05. This is for a well-powered experiment. The power of the experiment that corresponds to the inputs is printed here, and it is 0 0.78, 78%, so that's a well-powered experiment. In fact, there's a shortcut you can use to using this calculator because it can be shown, and I'll show you the slide in a moment, that the False positive risk is essentially independent of the effect size if you keep the power constant. So it depends only on the power rather than on the effect size per se. So what you can do is just adjust the number per sample or the effect size so that you get a power which matches that in your experiment. Of course, you have to use the power calculated from the experimental results, the post hoc power, that is uh, generally frowned upon, but it's been useful in this instance. Now here is table three from my 2017 paper. What it does is to summarize how you can translate a p-value into a false positive risk, or more generally, give a better measure than the p-value of the evidence provided by your experiment.
the p the observed p value in your one experiment is the input to this table that's down the left hand side it goes from 0 0.05 down to 0 0.001 the remaining columns show the various measures of evidence provided by your experiment the first column shows the prior probability you would need to assume in order to get a 5% false positive risk. For p equals 0.05, you'd have to be 87% sure that there was a real effect before you did the experiment in order to reduce the false positive risk to 5%. These prior probabilities, of course, are rather slippery. I did give an example earlier in which they might perhaps be interpreted as a long-term frequency, but in general, they're subjective probabilities, and as such, not at all intellectually satisfying. Nonetheless, if you have observed P equals 0.05, or just less, and claim to have an effect, you have to persuade the editor that, in some sense, you were 87% sure that there was a real effect before you did the experiment and you're unlikely to succeed in persuading him in that way. It, only when you get down to p equals 0.01 or 0.005 that that probability falls to a half or below and that is defensible if your hypothesis is plausible. Though if it's implausible, they would be too big to, to be defended. Uh, and another way to express the evidence provided by the experiment is the likelihood ratio. That's in this column. The likelihood ratio, to repeat, is the odds on the there being a real effect rather than zero effect. For p equals 0.05, we see that the likelihood ratio is about 3. In other words, it's the observations would be three times more likely if there was a real effect than if there was no effect. Odds of 3 on there being a real effect are unimpressive compared with the odds of 19 to 1 which you might infer if you wrongly interpreted the p-value. Likelihood ratios are literally the measure of the evidence provided by the experiment, so they may sound ideal. They have two disadvantages, though. One is that they're unfamiliar to most non-statisticians, and the other is that the likelihood ratio doesn't really give you any idea of what your risk of making a fool of yourself by falsely claiming an effect is seen. Even with p equals 0.001, where the likelihood ratio is 100, that might seem very safe, but as we'll see shortly, that's not necessarily the case. I think the number which I now prefer as a measure that could be cited along with the p-value and the confidence intervals is the minimum false positive risk. By minimum, I mean that for a, a prior probability of 0.5, a 50-50 chance before the experiment that the effect was a real effect. As I pointed out, this, when the prior odds are 1, as in this case, the likelihood ratio depends, the, the false positive risk depends only on the likelihood ratio. So, <coughs> as I've said re repeatedly now, for a p-value of 0.05, the minimum false positive risk is 27%, and 0.27, in fact, is 0.5%.
1 over 1 plus 2.8. You've got to, com uh, to, to, to change the odds into a probability, and that's what, what the calculation we have to do. So, for p equals 0 0.05, for example, the minimum false positive risk falls to 0 0.034, that's less than 0 0.05, so that might be considered good evidence with p equals 0 0.005. But that is the case only if you have a plausible hypothesis. If the false positive risk, if, if the uh, prior probability was as low as 0 0.1, so there's only one in ten chance before the experiment that your hypothesis was right, then we'd have a 76% false positive risk for p-values close to 0 0.05, but even for 0 0.005, we'd still have a 24% false positive risk. Recently, there was a paper with 72 authors in science which proposed reducing the threshold for statistical significance from 0 0.05 to 0 0.005. And these numbers show that that would be a reasonable procedure if the hypothesis was plausible, but if the prior was only 0.1, you'd still have a 24% false positive risk. So how low would ha P have to be in the, that case of the implausible hypothesis? Well, for P equals 0 0.001, we'd have a likelihood ratio of 100 on there being a real effect. The minimum false positive risk would be 0 0.01, but if it was an implausible hypothesis, the false positive risk would still be bigger than 0 0.05. It would be 0 0.08. So if you're testing an implausible hypothesis, the p-value has to be really rather low. In order to get a false positive risk of 0 0.05 when the prior is 0.1 you would have to observe a p-value of 0.0045 that's another tenfold lower than this revised threshold recommended by uh, 72 authors so that threshold isn't necessarily safe These next two slides are somewhat technical, so you can skip them if you want. I didn't put them in the original talk at the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine, but I'm putting them in this video for completeness. This slide, which is figure one from the 2018 paper, shows the effect, the relationship between normalised effect size and false positive risk. And what characterizes this plot is that the power is kept constant throughout the whole graph. And it's kept constant by changing the sample size. So for this smallest uh, sample, this smallest effect size of 0.1 standard deviations, the sample size would have to be 1495 in order to keep the power at 0.78 which is the power which this graph is constructed for but at the other end of the graph for the largest effect size of two standard deviations the number per sample would only have to be five to keep the power at 0.78 and what you can see is that the false positive risk is almost independent of the power when it's sorry it 
the false positive rate is almost independent of the normalised effect size when the power is kept constant at 0.78. The solid blue line is calculated by the P equals method, so it's around 26% in this case, because these are graphs relevant to the case where you observe a p-value close to 0.05. If you use the p equals method, as we pointed out before, the false positive risk is only just above the p-value, the dotted red line. But this is not the appropriate way to calculate it. The lesson from this graph is that, as I asserted when we were showing the slide of the false positive risk calculator, that if you match the power that you enter into the calculator with that from your experiment by adjusting the normalised effect size or the sample size such that the power you get is similar to that in your experiment, then the false positive risk will come out much the same. That's a useful shortcut. One thing that I got feedback on as soon as the calculator went up was that people noticed that if you look at the effect of sample size, then the false positive risk goes up to 100% when the samples get very big. This seems quite weird at first sight. For example, if you observe P equals 0.05, the false positive risk is around 20%, 26% for sample sizes up to 15 or so, but eventually it'll increase up to 100%. If P equals 0 0.0001, that's the lowest curve here, the orange curve, then as you'd expect, initially the false positive risk decreases as the sample size increases, but eventually too that will also go up to 100%. How can this be? Well, actually this is a very well-known phenomenon in statistics, it's called the Jeffries Lindley paradox, though it's not really a paradox, it's quite easily explainable. Because n is varied here, the power of the experiment varies from one point to another. For n equals 4, sample size of 4, the power of the experiment would be 0.22. For n equals 16, the power of the experiment would be 0.78. But if you go up to n equals 64, the highest point plotted, then the power is 0.9999 which is a value that's never achieved in practice, of course. So this would uh, is just a warning not to use unrealistic numbers that imply unrealistic powers. The reason that the false positive risk goes up to 100%, if we just consider the P equals 0.05 curve, is that if the power was 0.9999%, then it would be very rare to observe a p-value as large as 0.05. And that is why observing a p-value of 0 .5, 0.05 in an experiment with such very high power would make the null hypothesis um, We'd, we'd actually provide evidence for the null hypothesis.
you would expect almost all the p-values would be very much lower than 0.05 in that case. So this behavior, although it looks paradoxical, is actually easily explainable. And it, it is not a worry if you keep to the realistic powers when the curves are sort of flattish. OK, now back to the main talk. So the idea of this talk is to make some recommendations about what you should do to prevent making a fool of yourself. And this is a summary <coughs> of what I would like to see happen. The first thing to say is never ever use the words significant or non-significant. And correspondingly, don't use those pesky asterisks which have the same sort of meaning. The reason for this is because there is no way you can divide, put a hard dividing line between what's evidence and what isn't. P equals 0 0.05 means much the same thing as P equals 0 0.06 or P equals 0 0.04. They barely differ from one another, so it makes no sense to describe one as significant and one as non-significant. Just give the numbers. While we're on the topic of presentation, there's two other matters that would improve things quite a lot. First, don't use bar charts, bar graphs, without showing the original data points on them. There's lots of software that will do that now. And also, it's important to remember that it's a fundamental assumption of all significance tests that a treatments are allocated at random to the uh, test units. When the experiment is not randomized, then you, of course you could do a test of significance. Just remember that there's no reason to expect the results to be right. The essential role of randomization is explained in the things I've written about randomization tests. I wrote a whole textbook in 1971 to try to popularize them, but still people do t-tests. Now to the actual recommendations. I think you should still state a p-value and give an estimate of the effect size with its confidence intervals. But you need to give one other number because you have to be aware that the confidence intervals and the p-value don't tell you much at all about what really matters, which is the false discovery risk. So the p-value should be accompanied by an indication of what the likely false positive risk is. One way, uh, this is the way I now favor, is to specify the minimum false positive risk. Minimum in the sense that it's based on a prior probability of 0.5, but in other words, that on the premise that it's equally likely that there is a real effect and that there isn't before you did the experiment. This in fact is, as I pointed out, simply another way of expressing the likelihood ratio and it's the likelihood ratio which is the actual measure of evidence from the experiment. But to express it as a minimum false positive risk is an easier way to understand than likelihood ratios. Now, of course, this might be quite over-optimistic, but because if the hypothesis you're testing was an implausible one, it had a lower problem higher probability than 0.5, then in fact this the false positive risk might be a great deal bigger than this method would imply. But yeah, it, I think to do this would be a great improvement on the present situation. It's simple, 
and it gives a better idea than the p-value by far. Alternatives, slightly more sophisticated way, would be to accompany the p-value and confidence intervals by a calculation of the prior probability that it would be necessary to assume to achieve a false positive risk of, say, 5%. In my 2017 paper, this was the method I gave first priority to, and I think I've changed my mind a bit about that now. The problem with this method is, firstly, that it involves getting a grasp on this rather difficult concept of the prior probability, which many people are familiar with. And there's another disadvantage to this method too, because it risks, by choosing a false positive risk at some arbitrary value of, say, 5%, you run the risk of establishing a threshold between real and non-real, which is as undesirable as it would be in the case of the p-values being divided into significant and non-significant. Nonetheless, if along with your p-value you said that in order to get a reasonable false positive risk we have to assume that we're 85% likely to have a real effect before we did the experiment, that would give a good indication of the flimsiness of the evidence. So, give the p-value, the confidence intervals, and the effect size, and specify along with them the either the minimum false positive risk or else the prior probability that you would need to reduce the false positive risk to a, a reasonable value. The upshot, of course, of all of this is that p equals 0.04 doesn't mean you have discovered something, it means that your results might be worth another look. So, the upshot of all this is that the false positive, the rash of false positives that have appeared in the literature are entirely to be expected because people don't interpret p-values properly and indeed if you do interpret them properly you see that they're not a good measure. Of course it's true that the lower the p-value the less likely the null hypothesis is. The point is though that it's not calibrated properly in a sense. What you need to know is the problem, the false positive risk. And to that extent, it must be said that it's not entirely an exaggeration when Robert Matthews said of the great Ronald Fisher that the plain fact is that 70 years ago, Ronald Fisher gave scientists a mathematical machine for turning baloney into breakthroughs and flukes into funding. It's time to pull the plug. Of course, it's difficult to pull the plug because it's inconvenient for people's careers because they wouldn't be able to publish so many positive findings. But nevertheless, it has become exceedingly urgent because every false positive that appears in the literature just provides more ammunition for the anti-science Trump uh, sympathizers. In fact, it's not fair to blame Ronald Fisher because in 1926, almost a hundred years ago now, he said, personally the writer prefers to set a low standard of significance at the 5% point. Notice that he said that was a low standard of significance. And that a scientific fact should be regarded as experimentally established only if a properly designed experiment rarely fails to give this level of significance. In other words, he said, p less than 0.05 in a single experiment is not good evidence. It's only good evidence if you can get p less than 0.05 almost every time you repeat the experiment. That bit of wisdom from Ronald Fisher has, of course, been 
totally ignored. Of course, if you abandon the terms significant and non-significant, as I think is rather ur an urgent requirement, you should even more abandon some of the amazing circumlocutions that have appeared in the literature. The wonderful website of Matthew Hankins has collected a whole do dozens, hundreds of examples of them. Here, here are a few of his examples. A barely detectable statistically significant difference for P equals 0.07. A considerable trend towards significance for P equals 0.07. A non-significant trend towards significance for P equals 0.1. Approaches but fails to achieve a customary level of statistical significance for P equals 0.015. Barely fails to attain a statistically significance of the conventional values, p less than 0.1. Bordered on, but was not less than the accepted level of significance, p greater than 0.05. Fell just short of the traditional statistical level of statistical significance for p equals 0.051. Absolutely no sense any of these things. Not exactly significant, p equals 0.052. Not that significant, p equals 0.08. The website is wonderful. It contains hundreds more examples of these completely nonsensical statements. Right, I've done my best to express these ideas, some of which may be unfamiliar to you in the simplest way I can, but if you really want to know more, you'll have to read some of the papers. I'll just give you a quick rundown of them. The 2014 paper was done by simulations. That means it's relatively easy to understand, non-mathematical, but uh, not terribly general. In 2017, I wrote another paper also in Royal Society of Open Science. In this, I do exact calculations rather than simulation. Don't worry, the maths is all in the appendix, appendices. And this allows one to look at the effects of sample size you may all want to look at the reverse Bayes analysis, which is the analysis where you calculate the prior from the data rather than assuming a prior probability, and also introduce the web calculator, which I showed you. And the third proper paper I've written is in archive, and this has got more details of the assumptions, more concrete suggestions on how to change statistical practice and questions of sample size and power effects. This may or may not eventually appear in a proper journal. It doesn't really matter these days, does it? Um, we'll see. As well as the real papers, um, none of which are, are really very mathematical, except perhaps in the appendix, appendices, I made a couple of YouTube movies. The one most relevant to this, but it's a bit old now, really superseded, I think, by this this present movie, was, was about what I then called false discovery rates, but now called false positive risks. There's also another one about randomization tests, how to get a p-value with no mathematics. If you... I don't, I don't know anyone why anyone should do 
tea, students tea tests anymore, randomization tests are so much better. I wrote a textbook in 1971 saying that, but you still find people using tea tests, heaven knows why. They're very simple and they're explained in that movie. They're also explained in an article I wrote in Chalk Dust magazine. This is a magazine produced by UCL mathematics students and it's very good if you're interested in uh, anything mathematical. Uh, I do both randomization tests and a bit about false positive risks in that article you can find it on the web. And finally another more popular piece I wrote in Eon magazine in October 2016 and that is entirely non-mathematical it's really more about the problem of induction the problem of transposed conditionals just the logic of the thing so that's it I hope you have fun and most particularly I hope that some journal will be persuaded to suggest one or more of the methods that I have suggested because until a journal does it it'll never catch on. <laughs>